everyone. Welcome to Reach Higher Riverside, where we share all Reach Higher stories happening across the nation. My name is Priscilla Grijalva, and I am your Reach Higher Riverside podcast host. Hi everyone, I hope you had a great new year. To kick off our 2023 podcast, we have an interview with Dr. Angel Perez. He is the CEO of the National Association for College Admission Counseling. In this role, he represents more than 25,000 admission and counseling professionals worldwide. He is committed to post-secondary access and success. He is the primary voice of the association to government, media, and global partners. He is recognized as a national thought leader and a sought after speaker on issues of educational equity, access, and success in American education. I'm so excited to share this interview with you. Hi everyone, I'm with Dr. Angel Perez from NACAC. I'll go ahead and let him introduce himself. Hi everybody, I'm Angel Perez. I'm the CEO of the National Association for College Admission Counseling. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm so glad you could join us. Um, NACAC is a big part of my life, and I'm so grateful that you're here. Can you share a little bit about how you got involved in NACAC? Yeah, sure. Actually, um, I was a NACAC member for over two decades before I became the CEO. So I spent the majority of my career working in college admissions. 11 of those years, by the way, were not too far from you because I was in Claremont, California for 11 years. Um, and I, I just found NACAC to be this wonderful organization that brought people together, um, particularly in the admissions and high school counseling community, great opportunities for networking and education. I felt like NACAC was my professional home. So, But never in my wildest dreams would I have imagined when I got into college admissions or every year when I would pay those NACAC fees that I was going to become the CEO. So my life has certainly evolved in interesting ways. Yeah, it has, and you're doing great work. Um, So who should be a member of NACAC? Yeah, so, you know, the the way that I sort of define it is anyone who is helping young people in the transition to college process should be part of our community, Um, mostly because there are some really powerful conversations that happen on our platforms, in our conference um, even on, on our social media channels that I believe that anyone who's helping young people in the transition to college should be a part of. So the majority of our members are high school counselors like yourself who are based in schools or admission officers who work in higher education and help admit students to college. But we also have independent educational consultants um, and their community-based organizations, and also some um, corporate sponsors as well. So anyone who's interested, again, in that process is welcome to apply for membership. Now, being split as a middle school and high school counselor, it's really helped me, especially at the middle school level, too. Mm. Um, Can you talk about why it's so important for school counselors to be members of NACAC? Yeah, I think it's so critically important for uh, school counselors, regardless of the level that you're at, to to be a part of NACAC. Um, And a big part of that is because we really are the conveners of two very important sectors of education. And I'll, Priscilla, I'll tell you a story. So NACAC is a member of the Washington Higher Education Secretariat, which is a group of higher education associations here in Washington, D.C. And we do advocacy and um, try to join forces um, for the greater good of students and access. But I will tell you that NACAC is the only association that crosses both the K through 12 and higher education sector. So we're very unique because actually when we come together, whether it's in our conference or our online programming, it's very rare that you actually get high school counselors actually engaging, speaking with, and partnering with the admission officers who are admitting their students. Um, I can't tell you how many people... I don't know if you've had this experience coming to our conference, but I can't tell you how many high school counselors have told me because I went to a NACAC conference, you know, five of my students got into X university because I made that connection and the power of networking so much of um, the, I call it the business of college admissions is about the power of networking, Um, but also that there's a lot of education and training, a lot of programs that we provide, especially for new school counselors who are maybe a little overwhelmed by 
you know, how do I begin the college advising process? Um, you know, so many um, counseling programs, master's programs do not include college advising as part of the curriculum. It's something we're trying to work on at the national level. Um, and so those are some of the gaps that we try to fill at the National Association to help people who are in high school counseling shoes to feel well equipped to advise their students on college. Yeah, that's so true, especially like knowing that all the relationships I built with NACAC, like those those admissions officers are always there to support our students. So across the nation, like if you go to those conferences that NACAC holds in September, you can learn to meet all those people that can help you with your students' college admissions. Indeed. So that's really important. Um, what can school counselors do to address inequity in schools? Oh my goodness, that's uh that's a big question. And I, I think it's something we all think about. You know, I the the first thing that I would say. Um, and I remind people of this regardless whether you're in a high school or at a college, is all politics are local. And I think that the way to start to address inequities is really in your school. I think it gets very overwhelming to think of systems and districts and you know what's happening in the nation. I think if every single school counselor took the time to really think about what are ways that I can impact and move the needle for my students? Is there a policy in my school that is inhibiting students from succeeding? Um, is there a program that I can start in my school that is actually going to move the needle on getting more students into college, for example? So, you know, I often try to advise people, especially new professionals, don't try to take on the weight of the world, but think about what can I do at the local level? The other thing that I really would advise is pay very close attention to local politics. You know, I'm here in Washington, D.C., very ingrained in the politics of Congress and all of the, the different federal uh, stages in education. But what I've learned in, in my career is that the majority of education policy happens at the local level. And so it's really important that you are engaged in who are your school board members? Let's start there. And then who are the local politicians in my area who are actually being voted in and will be making decisions about the policies in my school? Um, and then obviously paying very close attention to the politics at the state level because it's those senators who will represent you um, at the federal level as well. So, so I would say start local in terms of what you could do at your school, but pay very close attention to politics because as we've learned over the last three or four years, politics really matters. Yeah, that is so true. Um, what is NACAC doing to address inequity in college admissions? Yes, that's a great question. There's so many different areas that, that we are trying to address. Uh, first of all, if you are listening to this podcast and have not um, read our report towards an equitable post-secondary education future, uh, which is a report that was sponsored by the uh, Lumina Foundation, actually. It is a, a report that really we're calling our North Star here around how we are going to begin tackling different areas of the college admission process that are, are, are obvious to be causing barriers to students um, and so, for example, thinking about not just federal policy or state policies, but also deconstructing the admission process, everything from what is it that colleges and universities require, and are those things actually barriers to low-income first-generation students of color? Perfect example. Uh, we partnered with an organization called Just Equations, and we put out a report that actually showed that requiring calculus in the college admissions process is actually inequitable. And it is actually something that um, so many students don't have access to, and as a result, don't have access to many institutions across the country. And so we're, we're looking at addressing issues of inequity, both on the political level, right? There are systemic issues like student loans and Pell Grants and all of those kinds of things that we represent you as our member and your students here in Washington, D.C., but then we're also working with our college and university partners across the country to really help them think about what are ways to evolve the college admissions process. We're also partnering with organizations like the Common Application, for example, and sitting on their panels as they try to reimagine their future. What does the future of the college application look like? So we're trying to tackle it in a lot of different ways, 
Um, and certainly welcome any advice, anyone who is listening um, that mm -hmm. would like to tell us how we might be able to tackle it. Because it is a really, really big um, uh, monumental task we're trying to take on here. Um, but we think if we tackle it one piece at a time, we'll move the needle. Yeah, that's amazing. I think like free college applications, like that would be amazing because why do they pay? We don't pay for college, or I'm sorry, job applications. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And then I know they have fee waivers, but like that's just another step for students. Like it just take away that barrier. Yeah, and it's it's things like that. And for example, you know, NACAC uh, for many years, even before my arrival, was advocating on the simplification of the free application for federal student aid, right? And so the all of the data shows that the more complicated the forms are, the fewer students actually complete them. And so we are, again, trying to look at everything from the application to financial aid forms to processes that actually we could move the needle on so that more students actually complete the process. Okay, well, that's good. Can you share about the Affirmative Diversity Coalition to support race-conscious admissions? Yeah, so this has been actually a huge part of what we have spent uh, this past year doing and that we will be doing in 2023. Um, many of you who are listening probably know that there is a Supreme Court case right now taking up uh, the case of whether or not using race in holistic college admission will be allowed moving forward. And so we wrote an amicus brief along with organizations like ACRO and the College Board and ACT really... Um, trying to help the court understand that the use of race in college admission is really important, not just for the diversity of institutions of higher education, but we are trying to make the case that this actually matters for American society. Um, you know, for most young people in this country, the first time they are really um, almost socially engineered to engage with people who are really, really different from them is when they go to college, right? Because we're still a very segregated society. I'm a perfect example. I was a low-income, first-generation Latino kid from the projects of the South Bronx. The first time I met wealthy white people was when I went to college. The first time I really made a close Muslim friend was mm -hmm. when I went to college, right? Because we were we engaged with each other. And if you take away... Um, college's ability to do that. I am very worried about, you know, we're already a divided society. How much more divided will we be if we can't have those engagements um, in, in colleges and universities? So we are doing everything we can um, to work with our constituencies to talk about the importance of this case. I have, as you probably know, spoken a lot to the media um, about this particular case. And regardless of the outcome of the case, we are going to work with colleges and universities around the country to help them move forward. Because the one thing I'm hearing from college and university presidents all over the country is they are not giving up on their diversity missions. Um, and so regardless of whether we have to go the way of the, the state of California, which actually cannot take race into consideration in the college admissions process in the public school system. Um, regardless, we will support our members in, in making that transition. So you did do several interviews and one interview that I wanted to talk about was the PBS NewsHour. Can mm -hmm. you talk about institutions at higher stake to diversity? Say that again. So institutions. Um, so like, for example, um, you had stated it is important for the American people to know that most institutions of higher education use race as one factor of many factors of holistic college admissions. It yeah. is important for institutions to take into account the entire lived experience of a student and that takes into account race. It is very difficult to evaluate a student's entire life without that into account. Can you talk about that more? Yeah, I'm impressed you remember that. Um, I don't even remember what I said to PBS News. But, um, but yeah, I, I just, you know, using the platform that, that I've been given, I'm trying to educate the media around what it means to practice holistic college admission. Most of the public doesn't understand that what that means is that an admissions officer is taking account not just grades or a test score or what a student has done in high school, but really their entire lived experience. And so that might be where they grew up or their socioeconomic background. And you can't talk about a student's lived experience without talking about race, particularly in a country like the United States. Racial identity is such a huge part of who we are. Um, and so we have been trying to frame holistic college admission and particularly the use of race as one small factor among 
many, many factors um, that colleges and universities take into account. So I just think it's important to be clear about that because I, I think sometimes the media portrays it as race being used as a yes or no factor on a college application. And it's certainly far from that. Okay, well, I can retweet that um, news hour <laughs> that you did for everyone to see if they want to hear it. It was a great interview. Thank you. If you could change one thing about education, what would you change and why? Oh, gosh, yes. Um, you're only going to give me one? All right. Um, <laughs> actually, I, I know what my answer is, and it is the way that the United States funds education. Um, I, I think it is a deeply flawed system, and in particular, um, not just school systems, because we know um, how underserved K through 12 uh, school systems are around the country, but in particular, higher education. The reason college costs so much is because we have pushed the cost of college down to the quote unquote consumer, which is the student. Right. But I worked on college and university campuses the majority of my career. I can tell you that no one goes into college admissions. Um, without really wanting to help support students, including financially to get into college. But when you are managing an enrollment office, you only have but certain dollars in financial aid. Um, and so I wish if I could change anything is that the United States would prioritize students going to college, would remove the financial barrier from them, would fund institutions of higher education better, and make decisions, right? I mean, we spend billions of dollars on many things in the United States, but we still feel that college is a, to a certain extent, an individual good, not a public good. And I feel very different about that. I think that, you know, if you go to college, Priscilla, and I go to college, that's a good thing, not just for us, but for society, because we become taxpaying individuals. All the research shows we're more civically engaged. It also shows that individuals just have a much larger contribution to society at large. And so, and you know, they're part of the workforce, so on and so forth. So, but when we when we are leaving out a huge chunk of students every single year because they can't afford it, what does that do to a future generation of people? What does that do to the workforce? What does that do to innovation in America? So I'll stop there because I could go on and on about this no. topic. But no, that's the okay. one thing. And, and, and by the way, I'll just mention that I think that's what's going to move the diversity needle. A lot of people say to me, like, what is it really going to take to get more low-income students, first-generation students, and students of color to college? And I say, money, that is what it's going to take, is in order to open the doors wider, we need funding for higher education. Um, so I'll stop there. No, that's a huge barrier. I agree. Like even with the student loans, like students don't want to take out all that debt. So I, I don't and, you know, it, we don't know anymore, especially, you know, the amount of debt that students have to take on these days. I understand their anxiety around the ROI, right? Because if you graduate as an undergraduate with 50, 60, 70, 80,000 dollars, um, that's a significant payment. You may not be able to pay rent or you may have to make decisions around whether or not you can have a car to go work to work. And so I, I fully understand the anxiety. And again, I, I just wish that as a nation, we could prioritize higher education for young people. Yeah, I totally agree with you on that. Uh, what do you have coming up next? Oh my goodness, there's so much coming up next. Um, well, I, I will say that... Um, you know, obviously, we're, we're paying very close attention to the Supreme Court, and we are going to be doing a lot of work in that space. Um, actually, next month, we are hosting an event for college and university presidents, CFOs, and boards of trustees um, in Chicago, and it's a first-of-its-kind event for NACAC. Um, it's bringing people together. It's called Elevate Equity. You can find it on our website. And it's basically bringing together leaders to talk about how do we ensure, one, how do we open the doors wider to higher education, but how do we ensure that diversity and revenue, for example, at institutions of higher ed are not mutually exclusive? And I think one of the reasons we're so passionate about this event is because a lot of people give admission officers so much power for what they can and cannot do. The reality of the matter is so many of these decisions are made by board members, university presidents, CFOs, so on and so forth. So we thought, let's get them in the room and let's have the conversation about how we do this together and create a national model. So there's a lot of that going on, plus new education and training programs and, and lots of internal things here. 
So again, if you're not a NACAC member, I hope you'll join us because we're going places and we're really excited about the year ahead. Yeah, that's good. And I love that you're such an advocate for school counselors. Um, I know we need more. And I know you're collaborating with ASCA, the American School Counselor Association. So thank you for that. Thank Is there you. anything else you would like our listeners to know? Um, no, actually, one thing I'll mention since you just mentioned school counseling is that most people don't know that I actually worked at a public school in New York City uh, for several years before I moved over to the higher education side. So I have a deep, deep empathy. Uh, and by the way, Priscilla, I found the job so hard, I immediately jumped over to higher education because I, I thought the work not only was so important, but the the extraordinary sacrifices that school counselors make in their lives um, to ensure that students have what they need. It's incredibly inspiring and it's why I do this work. Um, and by the way, I'm here because a school counselor tapped me on the shoulder. I was at a public school in New York City as a high school student with 5,000 kids in a building. Um, and wow. you know, of, of all my high school counselor had 600 kids in her caseload and somehow some way found me and tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey, young man, have you ever thought about going to college? And that is how my journey began. So I am very passionate about school counseling and the power of, you know, transformation that individuals in your role do. So I don't have a lot more to add, but just to say thank you for all you're doing. I know that you also serve on the Ask a Board on top of everything you do. Um, and doing this, this podcast is hopefully also a wonderful service to the profession and to young people. Well, thank you. I appreciate you. And I'm so glad your school counselor encouraged you to keep going. So um, right. it's an right. honor. By the way, I still stay in touch with her. She's 75 years old. Um, and I still stay in touch with her and follow up with her every year to remind her of the difference she's made in my life. Wow. I'm sure that really warms her heart. I know when students do that to me, it makes me happy. So thank you That's for doing right. that. That's right. Um, at the end of our podcast, we like to do the Sunshine Spotlight. Can you tell me at least one thing that's made you happy this week? One thing that's made me happy. Um, I, I tend to be a very happy person in general, but I would say what's made me really happy this week um, is that I have started the year off with really, really good intentions. Um, I, I just decided, you know, I want to be healthier this year. I want to do more yoga and meditation and it's only been like a week, but I'm off to a really, really good start. So I would say I'm happy about the intentions that I have set. And I invite everybody who's listening to um, join me in some good intentions for the year 2023. Okay, well, that's good. Um, I'd have to say mine is um, I got to attend my first ball. Um, it was the New Mexico governor's ball. She just got oh, really? Yeah, so... That was my first one. It was a lot of fun. I got to dress up and go with my family. So I'm so grateful to spend time with so them. So it was the inauguration of the governor? Yeah, for New Mexico. How cool is that? Yeah, it was, it was a great experience. So um, I'm just grateful for this new year and all the new things that are coming out with education. And I appreciate your advocacy on behalf of school counselors and college admissions. So thank you, Dr. Perez. Thank you for being on this podcast. If you could just say goodbye to everyone out there listening. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thanks for having me. Thank you for tuning in to Reach Higher Riverside. You can follow us on Twitter at RH Riverside. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel at Reach Higher Riverside. You can also subscribe to our iTunes or Google Play Music and give us a rating. Thank you so much for listening in. We appreciate all of you tuning in. And as Michelle Obama would say, when they go low, we reach higher.